don't they look sweet? Nice little thin, flexible solar cells. Ha, huh, cool bananas. Let's check them out. So what we've got is little uh, low light solar power, like solar energy harvesting development kits with these flexible film solar cells. And these are made in the United States of America. Fantastic. And they come in two different shapes here, but they appear to be sort of like identical technology though, just uh, different uh, uh, configurations. And um, we've got a little uh, uh, like battery uh, charging board and we've also got a, a Bluetooth uh, development board as well with these little um, lithium polymer batteries. And these use uh, TI uh, chipsets and uh, processor as well. So we'll hook that up and get that working in a minute. They've got an Android thing. And these actually are kind of like open sourcey. They come with the uh, like the board files and stuff like that. So if you want to play around with your own, and there's the Bluetooth uh, sensor development kit. Uh, they claim it works in less than uh, 200 lux, and, and it's got the Eagle CAD files and whatnot. And if we have a look on the back, ta-da! Here's our response curves. Terrific. So this is the uh, two-cell panel here. This is the uh, uh, characteristic curve for it at the various uh, uh, current outputs. And there's the voltage uh, curve. So you can work out the maximum power point if you like. Go for it. A little exercise for those playing along at home. But as, of course, with all these, uh, you know, low-light uh, solar cell technology, the power we're talking about is is not much. You know, it's enough to run a calculator or something like that. You know, we're talking in the order of, like, one milliwatt or less. And let's actually operate it right under its, uh, you know, its sort of like recommended spec limit there. And, you know, around about 70 lux, something like that. I've got my uh, uh, overhead studio lights turned off, so I'm just getting residual light from the other side of the room. And we're getting uh, about 2.3 volts, although we're going to get naff all current. There we go, about, uh, you know, 60, 70 microamps, something like that. But that's what you expect. But, you know, it's good enough for, like, a real ultra-low power energy harvesting. So this actually works quite down to really quite some low lux. I mean, we're talking 40 down there. I know this is not going to be precisely equivalent, sort of putting my hand over it. But still, you know, getting 38 microvolts. This is the short circuit uh, current, of course. But, yeah, it still works. It works down to quite low lux levels. That's... Yeah, it's pretty good. So let's install the Les 100 data monitor and thankfully it doesn't want my firstborn child. So just access the files and Bluetooth. No worries. Let's go. So do you think they're teamed up with TI? Maybe. And we found the board. Cool bananas. Got the solar panel hooked up here and our little LiPo battery and we can connect. So hopefully. Discovering. Nine services, total of 31 characteristics. Cool. Look at that. Like I bought one. Battery level, there you go. So we instantly get our battery level. <laughs> it's in millivolts, of course, 3.9 volts. So it's it's charging, is it? No. If I put my hand over the solar panel. Nut nah, zippity doo da. Oh, we got our light sensor. Let me put my hand over that. Yep. <laughs> Works a treat. There you go. That's it. 1200 lux. Ah, uh, we'll s uh, see how that compares to my light meter. There you go. That's close enough. Yep. No problem. That's pretty cool. We can control our uh, latency time, our connection interval, all that sort of jazz. Connection interval. Let's go right down. And hopefully, it'll take. will it take more power? If I... I put my hand over the solar cell again. It's going to chew the juice or what? Nope. <laughs> it's just sitting there. But it's Bluetooth. It takes bugger all. So really, you know, it, it's all being powered from this. If we disconnect the battery, it won't work at all. Let's actually uh, disconnect the battery and see if she still talks. Battery level. Um, <laughs> it dipped, um, but is that like, is that coming from the solar cell? So let's try it. Here we go. We'll cover it. Mm, yeah, it's not connecting at all anymore. Take my hand off. Is it going to reconnect? 
No, nah, it's not going to do diddly squat. I think we might have had uh, some capacitance on the board keeping it going because it's not going to reconnect. It's not going to work with just the solar panel. Yeah, there's no devices at all. And even if we shine a 20,000 lux torch on there, it's not going to do it. Again, let's shine that torch on. See if our battery level can... If it's going to do anything at all. Not really. It's just sort of sitting idle. Our luxometer is going to go through the roof. Where is our sensor? It's down there somewhere. I think we maxed it out. <coughs> Woo, there we go, that's better. So, okay, we've got ourselves a Bluetooth connectivity kit with a uh, TI uh, Bluetooth Micro that we can program, of course, very cool. It came came with a USB stick with uh, the development tools and stuff like that. I won't go into them, it's just a regular, you know, a TI development um, system. It just happens to be used for this little uh, Bluetooth uh, processor. We can change sort of stuff, but, like, we can't get anything on the actual solar panel. Um, like nothing. What's the, you know, what's the voltage coming out of it? What's the uh, charge rate? Stuff like that. All we've got is the battery voltage and I'm sitting here and I don't see this thing um, really charging at all. It's just sort of wiggle, 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 yeah. And like, so unfortunately, we just can't really get much. Um, the whole point of this is supposed to be evaluating the solar cells in an energy harvesting application and, uh, eh. Doesn't seem to do much at all. But it looks as though we actually have an option to get rid of the battery and uh, store the charge in a super cap. You can see they've got the uh, charge curves here of uh, time versus uh, the amount of uh, storage capacitance. Of course, the greater the storage capacitance, the uh, greater <laughs> storage capacity you have in your capacitive battery, so to speak. But the longer it's going to take to charge up before your circuit starts up, whatever application you've got, uh, to do anything useful. But but then, you know, if like shade comes over or something and, uh, you know, your solar cell is interrupted and it's not producing anything, then it comes, uh, then the charge comes back out of your um, capacitor. And of course, if your circuit takes too much, it's never going to charge up at all. So, you know, it's all a big trade-off. So I hooked on a uh, 2.5 farad huge 2.5 farad, none of these microfarads or millifarads rubbish um, on there and naturally it's going to take forever to charge up. It's just going to... I should put that on millivolts, actually. Like, there we go. It's charging up slowly. And if I put my torch on it, it should go even faster. But, yeah, we'll be waiting until the cows come home. That's too much capacitance. Hey, now we're talking. We're even overflowing. Check it out. I've got a 2200 microfarad cap. It says uh, 1800 mic minimum. And... Uh, that's charging fairly rapidly. If I turn my torch on, it's going to charge even quicker. And apparently uh, the Bluetooth turns on at uh, 3.2 volts, I believe it is. So, I oh, should have my app on. It should be, should be on now. Let me take that torch away. Yeah, it's draining down. See? No, it's holding the charge. There you go. Let's see if the app works. Yep. It's updating. There you go. Sweet. So it's working just from that on the ambient light. Granted, we're at about, uh, what are we, at 2,000 lux or something? We're at, uh, we're only about, you know, 1,000 lux here on the bench. Something like that. Depends. It's being, like, uh, you know, um, shielded by my camera and all sorts of stuff. Not exactly um, doing that, but you see that it's actually working from just that. And if I kill that... You'll notice that the battery drains, and that should drain faster if we pull it quicker, because the processor will take more power, and it should actually die when we get to... Can I put something on top of that? Put a multimeter on top of that. And it should die when we get to luxometer. Can we look at that? There you go, it's varying. So when it, it's supposed to die when it gets to about 3.2. We'll see. These are not the droids you are looking for. Still going, still going. 
I'm not sure what it operates down to, but I think I said it won't start up or something at three. Yeah, yep, yep, died at about three volts there. There you go. And you see that it stopped discharging because the process is not running anymore. In fact, it's it's the capacitors recovering. So there you go. That's dielectric, dielectric absorption for you. I think I've done a video on that somewhere. Anyway, cool. That's great. That works a treat. Oh, yep, it just automatically recovered itself there. And once we got to, it's now back up. Oh, it'll be negative now. All the electrons will fall out. There you go, 4.2 from this little piddly solar cell. Now, if I turn off my studio lights and we're at like 40 lux or no, 70 lux, was it before or something like that? Sorry about the, uh, if you can't, you should be able to just see that screen. It's going down, yeah. It doesn't have enough to uh, maintain that, so it's slowly discharging. And the other kit, of course, just comes with an ide looks like an identical uh, the TI charging uh, energy harvesting chipset. There it just doesn't have the Bluetoothy uh, part of it. So I guess if you're going to get the kit, you might as well get the uh, Bluetooth interface because then you can have a play around with that. Uh, you know, it comes with the Code Composer Studio code and all that sort of jazz. So that seems to work fine. There is no iOS uh, app. So if you've got one of those silly Apple things, uh, you're screwed. Well, you're screwed anyway for buying Apple in the first place. But anyway, well, hey, look at all the flame comments down below already. Oh. So thank you very much, Power Film Solar, for uh, sending in these. And they are really uh, quite jazzy. I'm not sure of the exact, you know, performance compared to other uh, competing flexible fin film ones on the market. But these are made in Yankee land and uh, they... It, here pretty good there like use them for military applications and all sorts of commercial applications and they'll even uh, develop ones for your custom application and uh, stuff like that and power film do actually have a whole bunch of off-the-shelf products they've got you know those portable uh, USB battery packs you know solar charging battery packs and all that sort of stuff the ones that you roll out and uh, things like that so um, but yeah this doesn't seem to be on the website couldn't find it at first go maybe it's a it's a new development tool. Anyway, I'll try and link it in down below. Thank you very much, Power Film. That's very cool. I like that. There's not much that goes into manufacturing those. These new printable, um, well, I'm not sh sure how these compare with the other uh, printable ones, which I've got. Hang on. Yeah, if you remember these ones that uh, came in a roll, and uh, these ones were actually uh, printed on a, like an ink jetty type uh, printer apparently like you they can manufacture them as long as you like I'm not sure about these uh, uh, power film ones but obviously by looking at the um, edges there they cut these off a longer strip so they probably have a similar sort of uh, pro printing process um, if there's any like manufacturing videos or something I'll embed it in here and they may obviously manufacture them in longer strips and they can cut them to whatever sort of you know power and size uh, requirement you're looking for so that's very cool thanks power film Powerfilm are an Iowa-based manufacturer of flexible, thin-film solar panels that provide custom solar products for industrial, consumer, and military remote power applications. First, the solar material must be produced. The basic roll processing where we make the core solar module begins with a roll of plastic, a very thin roll tends to be uh, somewhere around 30 microns thick and maybe a thousand feet long. That roll goes through a sequence of deposition machines to put down first a back metal contact followed by the semiconductor uh, amorphous silicon, uh, actually six layers of amorphous silicon which makes the solar cell itself. That's the part that absorbs the light and turns it into electricity. And then a top conductive layer that is also transparent, lets the light in, but also is conductive enough to bring the electricity out the front face. So you have the metal on the back, the, the transparent conductor on the front, that's where you get the power out. From here, the film is then loaded onto a laser scribing machine. Here, the roll is unwound on a machine that uses laser heads to scribe the material into sections that begin to make up the individual solar cells on the roll. From here, the rolls are moved onto the printing stage. Electrical insulators are printed between the individual solar cells in order to isolate the positive and negative sections, as well as also being run through a silver print machine. The silver print machine prints conductive silver ink particles that increase electrical conductivity. Once it's been tested, 
It goes through a process where the copper bus bar is put on, which is something we will solder to to get the electrical connections later. Then a laminate is put on the front surface and the back surface, and that's usually a Teflon type product that uh, is highly resistant to chemicals and water, moisture, uh, will protect the module from the environment. The roll is then loaded into a die cutting machine. This machine unwinds the roll and die cuts it into individual modules which can be used in a variety of products. The die cut modules are then loaded into a machine that tests each module electrically, one at a time. The machine places each module onto a lighted surface and probes check electrical characteristics. The modules are then sorted into pass and fail bins. Passing modules are then loaded into a large machine called the pick and place. Here, a robotic arm picks up individual modules, checks them for orientation and then places them onto a fabric surface. The robot keeps placing modules on a fabric in a pattern that has been determined by the computer. Once completed, a laser cuts the fabric piece, forming the outline of the foldable solar panel. Panels are taken from the pick and place station and operators then string the modules together on the fabric body using a flexible, multi-stranded wire known as a Litz wire. The steps here include using a soldering iron to burn away small sections of lamination over the conductive tape. Multiple connections are made to ensure that the solar panels are still operational, even if a wire breaks. Once that is all done, we will then run it through a lamination process, through a high heat lamination process, which helps bond everything together, helps reseal so that uh, the moisture resistance is improved. The panels are then moved to the sewing cell. Here, the edges of the panels are sewn. With the edges of the panels sewn, a top fabric wrap is added. Product labels are stitched on and strips are sewn over the wire attachment points. In the finishing cell, the operator adds a circuit board and connector. Grommets are added to the corners, which allows the user to strap down the panel in windy conditions. Completed units are then taken outdoors for a final test prior to packaging. Passing units are then packaged and moved to the shipping department in cases, ready to provide unlimited solar energy across the globe.